Hi, my name is Anne, and I'm one of the ministers here at this church. Hi, my name is Shiva, and I'm one of the kids here at church. And we just want you to know that you are welcome here. No matter where you are on life's exciting adventure, you are welcome into this sacred space. Even if it's on TV, even if it's on your phone, even if you aren't really sure why or how you found this YouTube channel, you are welcome to be with us today. We pause now for a time of prayer together. Who are the people and what are the places on your heart and your thoughts right now? What needs do you have personally that you would lift to God's spirit of love? Let's take a moment now to ponder all our prayer needs and concerns as we begin with a time of quiet meditation.
Let us pray. As the seasons change from summer to fall, creator of life, we wonder if you are looking for change in our lives too. Are you looking to see if our hearts are daily changing to be more compassionate, more grace-filled for one another? Are you looking to see if our vision changes from distraction to a focus on the challenges experienced by those in our community who struggle to find food, shelter, health, safety, and belonging? Are you looking to see if our attitudes are changing from despair and resignation to optimism that the world can be better if only we could trust in Jesus' way of love? Are you looking to see if our agendas are changing from worry and fear to hope and vision for a better tomorrow? Are you looking to see if our direction is changing from aimless wandering to a forward focus on justice and peace for all people? Giver of life, just as we see your beauty in the changes of the seasons that are beginning all around us, we pray that we would be part of that change that we might be a people continually transforming our hearts and minds to a deeper focus on your sacred love and your way for our lives. Amen. Your generous financial support not only allows us to continue our online ministry, but also supports our many efforts, which reach out to those in need. We invite you to share your financial gifts through the mail to the church office or via our quick and easy online Tithely Giving app. You'll find a link to the app in the description below today's video or on our website. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, a story that many find troubling because it seems to cast Jesus in a negative light. When an outsider, a Gentile, comes to him for help, Jesus at first refuses her, even referring to her with the insulting title, Dog. But by the end of the story, she seems to have convinced him that God's love is great enough to reach even the Gentiles. Reading from Mark 7, 24-30. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast out the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Hi everyone, Pastor Brian here. I'm glad that you've been able to join us for this time of worship together. Today we begin a new worship theme for October and part of the month of November we're calling the Underground Church. Sounds a little mysterious, doesn't it? Well, you know, throughout the history of the church, there's always been underground movements, those groups of Christians that were very faithful to the gospel, but who didn't always fit into the institution of the church. Or at times when the church has become part of the domination system, they've sort of been off to the side resisting that, being a voice of resistance in the midst of it all. And in some ways, we've begun to wonder here at First Christian if we are living into that tradition as well that we're a church that's different enough that we stand somewhat outside of the normal traditions of the Christian church, that um, we see theology a little bit differently, we see community a little bit differently, we see who is welcome in the church a little bit differently. And so we're gonna spend some time talking about what it might mean to take on that identity as the underground church. I think that one thing that the underground church does is it listens to and it lifts up voices that 
are often ignored, both in our culture, but certainly also within our religious spaces. And so we're gonna be doing a little bit of lifting up those voices during our time together. And we're gonna to start today with what we're calling soulful conversation. So rather than you just listening to me talk for a few minutes, I'm gonna be in conversation with a friend and a partner in ministry with First Christian Church, who has a unique story to tell. His name is Patrick Hall. Patrick is an entrepreneur here in St. Joseph. He is a business person, but he also has the unique calling of being a drag artist. He performs as the drag uh, persona Bianca Bliss. He's well known for it here in our community and in the state of Missouri and beyond. And you're going to find out that Patrick's art as a drag performer has a lot to do with who he is as a Christian and with his faith journey. And so a few days ago, I sat down with Patrick over Zoom, as you'll notice, and we just had a conversation about who he is, about the art that he performs, and what it all has to do with his faith journey and um, maybe his place within the underground church. So I invite you now to listen to that conversation, see if you maybe hear a little bit of yourself within it as well. Well, hi, Patrick. Thanks for being willing to be sort of our guinea pig here and be the first person we're trying out this new thing we're calling Soulful Conversation with. Uh, so you're our you're our first person we're asking you to sit down and tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Are you ready to give it a try? Yeah, yeah. So I guess it starts that I started going to a church when I was 14 that was a Assemblies of God Church, Evangelical Faith. Um, I spent all the way up until probably I was 21 going to this church. And, um, you know, to be quite honest, I think what's important to understand is growing up in that faith. It wasn't based off God loving you because you exist or because he created you. It was more based off of how holy were you? It was a holiness movement. How good were you? What you did for God? It left me questioning my faith. In a lot of ways, because I always felt like I couldn't quite measure up to what I was expected to be from God. So I would leave church always kind of feeling battered and bruised and emotionally just like a failure, I, I, I guess. Um, and I think that when I went to that church, I was looking for something. It's ironic. I've told people this before. At that time in my life, that church was very pivotal to the person who I had become. It was through my faith that I wound up getting, learning that I needed a self-esteem. I didn't really have one. Um, it was through my faith and the people in that church that taught me that I was worth loving and that, and that I mattered. And unfortunately, it was that all church as well that told me that I wasn't worth anything and that I didn't matter after they had instilled that in me because of me being gay. So you were actually in some way serving in a leadership position at the church at the time when you had decided to come out to your pastor. Is that right? Yes, I was on the praise and worship team. I was a youth pastor at the time, um, running their youth group. Um, I think it's important to understand that every time I went to church or they would have a talk with me. God's going to use you. God's got mm -hmm. big plans for you, Patrick. You're meant for something bigger. You're meant to change the world. And those are great ideas, but they think it always had to be big. The, oh. the whole faith was big. The celebration of God was big and praise and worship, um, the theatrics of the service. And I mean, for a young person, it was like, this is cool. Like this, they've got a rock band up here, um, you know, like that's great music. And it just kind of fit my life at that point. And I was searching for something. I was very depressed at that time. Um, and the church had found me probably at my lowest point that I've ever been in my life. And through my faith journey through that church, you know, it's amazing when you already feel unloved and unwanted and not enough that you would go to a church that would continue to basically tell you the exact same thing. Well, guess what? You're not wrong, Patrick. 
So I think no. um, that was one, that was the thing with that church that until later years, I didn't realize I was actually indoctrinated that I had believed things that maybe weren't as true as I thought they were. And I think seeing how abusive that relationship was because it was like God looking at you every time you walked in, they're going, you still aren't good enough. You're not going to make it. You know, you're, you're bound for hell. There it was. Don't question God. Don't, don't, it's the, in the Bible, it's God. And if you don't believe it, then there's something wrong with you. You have a lack of faith. Mm. And I think that not being able to feel like I could question it, I look back now and realize that it really perpetuated a lot of harm in my personal life. But, you know, I, I understand the struggle when you've heard the other message so many times. It's it's there. And I hear this story from other folks that it always surprises me, though. Like, how do we go from a, a, a faith based on Jesus telling people about how much they're loved by God and, and how much people should see themselves as worthy? And then somehow we have twisted it to be a faith that says, well, you're worthy if you can measure up to certain standards and God might love you if you uh, are a certain way. And so you've told me that when you came out at that one church that they did not react very well. They really didn't know how to react, I guess. And and so did you leave the church period for a while then after that? Was it, were you kind of like, I'm, I'm done with church? I, yes. I mean, I was told I was no longer welcome. Honestly, their words were, I'd rather see you go hell from a distance than to go to hell in front of our face and you're no longer welcome. And I did. I, I quit going to church because I always tell people this and I don't know how, why it was this way for me. If maybe I just had a wisdom beyond my years, but I always knew that it wasn't God that I was mad at. I never was mad at God. Mm -hmm. I was mad at Christians. So um, some people in our community know you from church. Some people know you because you are one of the um, best known hairstylists in town. But there's a good number of people that maybe only know you by your uh, drag persona. So do you want to tell me a little bit about how how did you get started in drag and how did you develop the your alter ego in drag? So I started, I was thinking back on this. I'm pretty sure I'm about to hit my 18th year this wow. October. Um, I started basically, I dressed up for a Halloween party. Uh, at a local gay bar here in St. Joe that's no longer open. And uh, I decided to go and drag. And the owner of the bar had pretty much lost all of his dra drag queens that were in his regular show. And he's like, you know what? You look so great. You look so good. You should, you should try to do a couple of shows. He's like, give me six shows. And after that, if you don't love it, I won't bother you anymore. And so that's how I kind of started doing drag. It was kind of like on a, um, and to be quite honest, the only drag queens that I had ever known scared me. Um, so <laughs> they were intense personalities that were bigger than life. And I think a lot of that had to do with how small I felt mm -hmm. and to see other people living so loud, it was intimidating. I was like, I, once again, I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. And, um, but when I started doing drag, I instantaneously fell in love with it. And I, I've been really fortunate, I think. Bianca's been a, I think I've learned more from Bianca than I've probably learned from anything in my life. She gave me a voice when I really didn't want to speak out ever. I wanted to kind of hide. She showed me that I was brave, that um, if I could get on a stage, and present a female illusion that I could do anything. What I loved about her the most is she was a lot different at first than Patrick. I was quiet and shy. And in me, almost immediately, she was bold and strong and courageous. And I think that as time, as the time has gone by and I've con was her, that I learned how to reconcile the two together and i think now bianca and patrick are so much more the same but different but my values are the same the way that i choose to present bianca is based on 
Patrick's beliefs and ideals. I love that. So that's that means the strength that you find as you are Bianca is not a it's not an act or a put on. It's part of who you are as Patrick. It's just you can express it in a way. So Bianca really lets you affirm the person that maybe that church a long time ago was not willing to affirm, you know, that you are a person of great strength and abilities and that you are a person that's worthy of love and that you can love other people. I think the way that Bianca impacted my life, I was always flamboyant. As a young boy, grew up in Texas around bikers. And I'm talking about like Harley Davidson, 1980s bikers, cowboys on a cattle ranch, and roughnecks in the oil field. And they were so masculine that I really, really stuck out. And I was always told, man up, quit crying, boys don't cry. And I think Bianca was the first time that not only that femininity that I actually possessed inside, she was not only celebrated for being that way, she, those feminine qualities were praised and rewarded. Well, that's really interesting. So the scripture text that we're talking about in today's worship service is this story about um, Jesus is in um, foreign territory, and he's approached by this woman, this non-Jewish woman, who, who wants him to come help her daughter and Jesus's response basically is yeah sorry I can't help you you're not a Jew I'm here for the the lambs of God not for the dog she he literally kind of refers to her by this insult that a dog and her response is yeah well even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall underneath the table and Jesus like he's taken aback like she's called him out like here's a woman in a culture where women are supposed to keep quiet and aren't supposed to be authorities and she's just called him out and really told him, you got it wrong. Uh, you, you you can come and serve me just like you're serving your own people. And he is corrected by her. And he's he's sort of like, you're right. You know, you, you're you're right. And from that point on in that in that gospel, Jesus starts serving the Gentiles, too. And it just occurs to me that there's something about the sacred feminine that um, some churches struggle with this idea that, that the, they sort of see women as second class or women should keep quiet in church. And we're seeing a lot of uh, conservative Christians right now that have huge issues with drag uh, performers, drag queen story hours. And what, what do you think about all that? Why is this suddenly such an issue? The church, honestly, I don't think there's a real reason. I think that the reason they hate it is it challenges their ideas and norms of sexuality. And a lot of people right now, this woke culture because we've now realized that gender is a spectrum. It's not binary. Ooh, that's right. Yeah. And that that threat of changing that, of yes. change, just freaks them out. They I think are right like about that. Yeah. And if you think about it, in the vast majority of the church worldwide, um, uh, women are not allowed to be pastors. They don't have any leadership positions. Um, uh and so here I think you that, are as a man saying, I value the feminine, I celebrate females, and I, I can see how that would be off-putting to some people to say, no, a man's not supposed to do that. We're only supposed to celebrate the male, and here you are celebrating the whole totality of both male and female altogether. And I think that's what drag is, though. Drag is a protest to gender norms. It's been going on forever, yeah. forever. But it's a, now, especially in our modern day, from the 60s on, drag was like, no, I'm going to express myself. And there are masculine and feminine qualities that I possess. And, and you know, I think there could be people like, well, obviously, you know, he's a Christian, but he must set that aside when he does drag. But I've seen so many of your performances where you use your platform to be a, a person that puts very powerful, uh, affirming messages out to the community that you inspire people. I mean, I always think, hey, Patrick's taking us to church whenever I see you up there doing that, because you're really up there given the message that we want that people are loved and should feel like they're worthy. Well, I think that that's a responsibility that I have not only to myself, because I work so hard and I know that God works so hard on me to finally get me to understand that I am lovable, that I deserve kindness, that I matter, 
And I think because I have been blessed enough to have people come into my life that helped me to understand that. And, and also just God, just by praying and, and seeking God in his existence in my life. I think that those qualities were within me. And I believe as Bianca, I know how important it is to give that message to others because people are hurting. People are scared. We owe it to the younger generations that are behind us because these generations, they don't know what this is like. They've never experienced this. The name calling, people saying horrible things like you're an abomination. It's traumatizing to them right now. They're hurting. So if I have an opportunity to remind them that you're not what people say you are, you're exactly what God says you are. And that is an, a, a lovable creation, perfectly imperfect, just the way he created us to be. But there's grace in that. And if God can love you in that, you should be able to love yourself as well. I love that. And I and I do think, I know having watched some of your uh, performing, uh, you create that when you perform. I, I am always amazed by the energy in the crowd that they really just feel like it's a, they're being taken to church. They're having a, a moment of being loved. and. And your music is always so positive. And and uh, if churches could be more like that, more like drag shows, imagine how much better a world we would be. It probably would get a lot more people in the pews. <laughs> sure. They'd be a lot more entertaining, wouldn't they? Absolutely. Thank you for taking time to have this uh, conversation, to share a little bit about your faith journey. And hopefully folks that are watching or listening will hear a bit of their own story and, and uh, um, think about what kind of journey they've been on. So thank you for being who you are and giving us your time today. Thank you. As our service draws to a close, we have one more stop to make at the table of communion. The table of God's dream where all are fed and all have a place to belong. You're invited to join us in this meal, either by using something you have at home to represent the bread and the cup, or you may simply join us in spirit today. Remember with me now the story of faith, how Jesus met with his disciples and took the bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body, my life, lived for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we recall how after the meal, he took the cup and he poured out the wine and he gave it to them saying, this is the wine of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. And I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day I drink it with you in the kingdom of God's love. Now that we have shared in this sacred meal, let's join in saying together the prayer that scripture tells us Jesus taught to his own disciples. Our creator who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. As you go about your week, may you remember that you are a sacred creation and that your stories are sacred too. You are loved. Go in peace. Go in peace. Amen. Sign up for our weekly email newsletter to keep up to date on all our ministry news. See the link in the description below today's video. Interested in becoming an online member of our faith community? Contact Pastor Brian to learn more.
Our Blessing Box Outreach is always in need of non-perishable food to help feed those in need. Drop food donations at the church or give a monetary donation via the Tithely link below. This has been an online worship experience brought to you by First Christian of St. Joseph, Missouri and produced by online ministry coordinator Jason Jasper. Please see the description below today's video for important links and media attributions. First Christian. Where love comes first.